<laughs> well, it's for elective classes, we only offer just one section of oh, those courses. Awesome. That's because the electives, you know, in spirit, they're supposed to be, you know, more specialized subjects. And so we want to keep a variety of them. And so mm -hmm. we offer two, two sections of one elective. That's like one less of another one. So, you know, we want to make sure it's, it's, it's diverse. Okay. Will, will this class for yeah, if, if you're looking to apply for like a biomedical or bioengineering company, then they, they would, of course, love to see that if you're taking some kind of biomechanics or any kind of applied uh, bioengineering type of course. Yeah. Do you have any contact for your previous students having like jobs in the medical device school? Uh, one of my previous uh, students that did uh, that did research with me, he's, he's working at a medical device uh, manufacturing company. Um, yeah, and then that's the only one. One one is going to grad school, or, or he's he's get he's he's pursuing his PhD. Another one is looking for jobs right now, and then the other one is working at Google. So, so out of out of the students that I, I've worked with directly, then I only know one for sure is working at a medical device company. Yeah. Yeah, that's fine. That's fine. Yeah, so, thinking, um, we can solve, well, I don't know if we can do it, but we can solve the shops, problems. Oh, from your system? And honestly, if, uh, I might not say it. It was too bad for me. Yeah. I didn't see these down so I have to be very close. And then right from the end of the part of the video, I don't know about that. Are you able to and I read the There are parts where he He kind of looked like twice for one day. There were there were parts that lost me. I think it was a crash. I was uncomfortable with it. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen that in right side is uh, during your left yeah. side. Yeah. I've seen yeah. that. I've talked about that last semester. Yeah. I only know that. Yeah. It is nothing. I think you want to see that. I have to go into it. So maybe tomorrow I will. Did you say you think of the exam? I don't remember, but if not, yeah. that was the same way. Because the longer the longer the, the, the more the easy it feels, the harder that it is. But I would say it's used to be a long week. Yeah, it's fact. Oh my gosh, I need like two weeks sometimes. Like, yeah, I'm sure I saw the wind all the way. Oh, that is a good thing. Yeah. Yeah, it's a good thing. Yeah, 
That's good. That's really good. That was a couple of five minutes. It was the first time I ever had to be important. I never had to be able to Yeah. Then, did I talk to you first? I talked to her about the exact same thing. And she said, yeah. And she had to be able to tell you that. She told me that she had a secret of the film. Yeah. But not that. Like she was very scared and then only the same thing. It was very like you know, it was a very cool way which is like a piece of the way. It's called the tree. Like it can be a very good way. And then I think it reminds me of the two words. Thank you. 
Um, we just have to the key thing on it. So it's like the first thing I'll do is the same thing. So I might be the reason I need to go to the other side of the world. Yes, I'm going to get the thing. Yeah, I'm going to get the thing. Yes, 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 I'm going to get the thing. All right, it's uh, one o'clock. Let's go ahead and get started. All right, good afternoon, everyone. How's everyone doing today? Good, staying cool, staying cool. It's it's warm. We had a spot of rain this morning, which was surprising. Um, I think, although I think a lot of weather reports are saying we're supposed to get a lot more rain this weekend, which will be a big, a big relief. So hopefully the heat wave is, is going to end soon. All right. So uh, announcements. So I, I did post homework two. So homework two is available on Canvas for you. Okay. The topics for homework two are going to be cash flow conversions and present work analysis. And so. Uh, pretty much after the lecture today, you should be able to do everything on that homework. 
uh, and that's going to be due a week from today. And so next Thursday, uh, September 15th by 11:59. Um, I've started, I've, I've started, I've, I've opened up your guys' homeworks, and so I haven't graded, actually graded any yet. And so I think I'll probably have those, your homework ones graded by tomorrow. That's, that's my plan. Okay. All right. And so, um, that's it for my announcements. Are there any questions I can answer before we get started today? Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and, uh, continue where we left off. And we are and so last time we were talking about present worth analysis. And the whole idea with present worth analysis is that we're looking to do uh, what I call economic comparisons using the cash flow conversions that we've, uh, we've been learning. Okay? And in particular, you know, what we want to do is for each for each economic option that we're considering, convert all of the cash flows to a present sum and then use that to compare against other options. Okay? And so the idea is that you know when you're when you're making a choice for, for your engineering project, usually it's a choice between you know whether you should go with certain manufacturer or certain part or certain um, you know certain machine. If you can kind of distill all of their all the financial information into just one number, and then you can compare that one number across you know other options, then you can make kind of the, the best informed economic decision. Okay. All right, and so I, I did want to start today with an example, and so you know I, I think we ended last Tuesday with an example, and so I want to do another one um, today. Because okay. with a lot of these, you know, and, and this goes for everything that we covered before too, you know, the only way to really kind of get good at them and kind of recognize a lot of these patterns is to just kind of do just do more problems. And so, um, you know, I, I try to do as many examples as I can in the lectures. I will say that, you know, because of time constraints, I don't have time to cover every example. Um, and so if you're following along with the lecture notes that I'm posting online, you'll see maybe one or two more examples than what I could cover in class. And so if you want to see some more, uh, some more of these problems worked out, you know, I would definitely check those out. Okay. okay. But for this example, you know, let's, uh, let's say that your building needs to um, replace an elevator. Okay, and so after after your initial search, you were, you were able to kind of narrow uh, the vendors down to just two, okay? And so here are the two options you're considering. And so the first option is uh, from a company called Otis. And so I believe they actually make the elevators for our, for our building here. Okay. And so the Otis elevator company is uh, gave you a quote for a $35,000 initial cost. And so that's for the purchase of the parts and the installation. Okay. You will have to maintain the, the elevator using uh, an Otis um, licensed technician. And so that's gonna cost $5,000 per year. Okay. And then uh, after five years, which is you know the amount of time that you plan on using the elevator, you can salvage the parts for an estimated ten thousand dollars. Okay. So that's the first option.
Uh, the other comp the other company that gave you a competitive quote is uh, Mitsubishi, which I you know I didn't learn made elevators until I actually wrote this problem. Okay. And so Mitsubishi is is offering you an initial cost of fifty thousand dollars. So quite a bit higher than the Otis one, um, but the annual maintenance costs are gonna be a lot lower. And so the annual maintenance costs are just gonna be $1,000. And then again, at the end of five years, after you're done using the elevator, you can salvage the parts for $5,000. Right, so for this problem, we're going to assume an 8% interest rate. And then what we want to do is we want to use present work analysis to determine which elevator is going to be the most economically efficient one to buy. Okay. Actually, this is, this is a good time. So after, after the class on Tuesday, someone asked me a really good question. So someone asked me, you know, why are we even, you know, what, what is the point of the interest rate in the problem? You know, we're just purchasing parts. And so, uh, which, is a, which is a great question, right? Because normally when you're, when you're looking to purchase something, you're not really thinking about interest rates at all. Um, and so, you know, the interest rate here, it's, it's, it's a reflection of how much that money can be grown over time at a market rate, right? And so typically, you know, the way these, these work is that, you know, if, you know, say that you're working at this company, you're an engineering manager, you know, and if, you, if you're even considering these two options, basically the company has given you, let's say in this case, a $50,000 budget to purchase an elevator, right? And so, um, you know, that's kind of what you're looking at. And so the idea is that, you know, if you, if you do go with option one, which is a much cheaper initial cost, you know, you have $15,000 extra. What you're going to do with that $15,000 is that you're going to invest it in the market at an 8% interest rate. And so that interest rate kind of represents how, you know, any extra money that you have or any extra money that you save can be invested in the market and then return to the company as, as, as a return. Okay. And so that's why we attach interest rates to these problems. It's, it's not, it's not, it's not arbitrary, although it seems, it seems like it is, but it's, you know, it's, it's kind of a reflection of how much how the market is going at the time and how much money, the value of money is going to change over the period of your, of your, of your project. Okay. okay. Um, any questions on, on just kind of the setup for this problem here? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and jump right in. And so the first thing we're going to do is we're going to draw the cash flow diagrams for both of these, um, both of these options. Right, always a good thing to do. Okay, so let's do the Otis. Let's do the Otis elevator first. Okay, and so the Otis elevator has an initial cost of thirty-five thousand dollars. And an annual maintenance cost of five thousand. Okay? So each of these are going to be five thousand dollars. Okay. And then at the end of five years, we can salvage it for ten thousand. So we can represent that as an up, up arrow. Remember, a salvage value is you know the money that you get back. Uh, for basically selling the parts or selling the elevator to some to someone else. Okay. 
And so that's going to be an, an up arrow. All right, so let's do the same thing for Mitsubishi. And so for Mitsubishi, we have a larger initial cost. And so we have an initial cost of $50,000. Okay. But our maintenance costs are going to be a lot less. And so our maintenance costs each year is going to be $1,000. Okay. And then our salvage value after five years is going to be. Five thousand. Okay. okay. So now that we have the cash flow diagrams drawn, you know we can have a, we can see kind of a, a clear picture of what their, um, you know, what their cash flows are going to be like. And so even though the Mitsubishi one, you know, we pay a lot more upfront, but you know we're going to have much lower maintenance costs, right? Um, but the Otis elevator is is the opposite. Okay, but but they have they actually have the same structure. So both both the Otis elevator and the Mitsubishi one, they both have an initial cost, they both have a yearly maintenance cost, and they both have a salvage value. So you know this this is actually pretty nice because we can actually use the same setup or the same formula for both present works and just kind of change the numbers around depending on um, depending on which option that we're considering. Okay. All right. So now let's go ahead and compute. Present worth. Okay. And so let's set up a formula where you know we're going to we're going to convert all the cash flows in both of these options into a, a present sum or P. Okay. All right. All right. Let's do the Otis one first. And so the Otis one has an initial cost of thirty five thousand okay. dollars. And so since it's a cost, we're going to make that a negative. And the nice thing about this is that you know it's already in present sum format because it's you know a cost that we would incur today, and so we don't have to do any conversion for that um, thirty-five thousand. Okay. All right. Next, we have the maintenance costs, and so the maintenance costs are five thousand dollars. Okay. But this five thousand dollars is a uniform series because it's a recurring it's a recurring cost that's occurring every year for five years, okay? And so we need to convert this to a, a P, and so we're going to do a P over A. Our interest rate is eight percent, and the number of periods that we're considering is five. Okay? And the good thing about this one too is that because the maintenance starts in year one and goes all the way until the end of the period then this is a, this is the standard form for a uniform series. And so we only have to perform just one, just one conversion thing. Okay. Right. And then finally we have the salvage value. And so the salvage value is a single lump sum that happens in the future. It happens in year five. Okay. So that means this 10,000 is an F. And so we need to com uh, convert that F to a P. And so we have P over F, 8%. And the year that the, uh, uh, or the time period that this uh, future sum is occurring is in year five. And so we're gonna do five, just like that. Okay. And so, of course, now the next step, now that we've determined which conversion factors we need, we can go ahead and look those up in the compound interest tables. Okay. And so for this one, uh, for P over A, this is P over A for 8% and uh, for N is equal to 5. And so we look this up in the table. This is 3.993. Okay. And then we do the same thing for the P over F. And so the P over F for 8% and five, this is 0 
right? So now we just have an algebraic equation. And so we have um, uh, minus 35,000 minus 5,000 times 3.993 plus 10,000 times 0 0.6806. Okay, and so you perform all that math. And what we get is minus 48,159. So I think this is a little bit different. This is a little bit different than the example we did last time because the example we did last time considered revenue as well. And so your elevator is not really producing revenue uh, unless they start charging you to use that elevator, which I hope no one ever thinks of that because that's terrible. But um, but this is, you know, and so this is an example where we're basically looking to minimize costs, okay? And so the way that we can interpret this number right here is that, you know, if you consider all the maintenance costs over those five years together with the salvage value, it's basically the same thing as writing a check for $48,000, uh, $48,159 today. Okay. And so that's like a today cost of you know buying this elevator and, and doing all the maintenance over, over the five years. Okay. okay, so let's do the same thing, but for the Mitsubishi elevator. Okay. And so luckily the Mitsubishi elevator has the exact same, um, you know, exact same format. It's just that the numbers are a bit different. Okay. So let's go ahead and fill in the initial cost. So the initial cost is $50,000. Okay. The maintenance on the elevator is $1,000, but this is a uniform series. And so we need to convert this to a P. Okay. So this is minus 1,000 P over A, 8% and five. Okay. And then we have the salvage value. Salvage value is $5,000. P over F, 8% and five. So once again, you know, we're, we're at this point where we need to look up these convergence factors in the compound interest tables. But if you look, if you look at this formula compared to the one for the Otis one, actually I should label this, this is Otis. Okay. These conversion factors that we're looking for are exactly the same, right? So we have P over A, 8% 5, and then P over F, 8% 5. And so we can just, you know, fill in the exact same values that we did above. So we don't have to bother looking at the tables again. And so from the previous equation, we know this one is going to be 3.993. And this one, the second one here is going to be 0 0.6806. Okay. So once again, we're going to go ahead and plug, uh, plug those numbers in, punch into our calculator. And what we get is minus uh, 50,590. And that's a Mitsubishi. All right, and so based and so based on these results, you know, in, in this case, you know, because both present words were negative, you know, we want to minimize costs as much as possible. You know, which 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 elevator here is the better one to go with? Otis, right? Because Otis has you know um, you know slightly slightly less cost, right? Um, and so you know it's. It's, this is this is useful because I think some people when they would look at a problem like this said, wow you know the maintenance costs for Otis are five times higher than the Mitsubishi one and we got to pay that five times and so you know, that mean that might lead some people to think you know the Mitsubishi one might be better option because you know you pay more but then over time you pay less but remember you know money that you money that's happening in the future is less valuable than today and so saving that fifteen thousand um, dollars today for Otis is actually really uh, really clutch because then you know you can spend that on other stuff you can invest it you can put it in the market things like that and in the end you actually save more money doing the cheaper option for, for this okay and of course you know all of this is assuming that both elevators operate the same they have the same standards same you know same same specs and everything but you're just looking at the economic aspect here. all right any questions on on this okay all right, and so you know that's and so that's present worth analysis in in a nutshell. Okay, so basically you're going to take you know whatever the cash flows are for your different options, convert it to a present sum, and then compare that across other present sums. 
But the two examples we've done so far are, are very clean, right? And so in particular, if we look at the, the n's, right? So the number of time periods, they're always the same between the two options, right? And so the last example we did on Tuesday and the one we did today, you know, we are operating with the same time period. Uh, but that's not always going to be the case when you're doing comparisons, right? And so some some companies might make their machine, they might design it to last for you know maybe eight years, but then another company might design a comparable machine, but they only rate it for six years, right? And so when you have differing time periods or differing what we call project lives, it can be a bit uh, it can be a bit more complicated to do present worth analysis. Right? And so let's go over how we can deal with those situations. Okay. All right. And so when we're comparing, you know, different projects with different lives, you know, we're still, we still want to do a comparison. But what we'll see is that if we just perform present worth analysis straight up on, you know, products with different lives, we're going to get very different numbers that may be misleading. Okay. And the reason the reason that they can give misleading results is that you know n or the number of time periods that you're considering um, is a strong is a strong factor in the equations that we're using. Okay. And so I know, you know, probably, probably at this point, you know, where I'm, I'm going to assume most people are going to be using the compound interest tables. But if you remember uh, from a lot of the equations that we looked at last week, you know, N was a big factor there. And so a lot of times N was actually in the exponent, uh, which means it's an even greater factor. Okay. And when you're doing comparisons, you know, you, we don't want a factor like this to kind of, you know, affect our results because Ideally, the only thing that we should be comparing in these comparisons are just the or just the cash flows themselves. And so if you're considering the number of time periods as well, then that kind of makes the results a lot more difficult to um, you know uh, to interpret. Okay? And so we have to find a way to to deal with this. otherwise, you know it may not it may not give you results that you can really trust. Okay? And so there's 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 multiple ways that you can handle it. Uh, one way is to just not even use present worth analysis, which you know we'll, we'll go over a different method next week. Um, but if you but if you want to do present worth analysis, one way that you can do it is to do what I call the least common multiple um, strategy. And so basically, you know, um, we, we're going to take the idea is that, you know, if you have two different options and they have differing lives, you know, 
the idea is to find the least common multiple of those two and then use that for analysis. Okay? And so as an example, let's say that product one, product one has a life of um, four years. Okay? While product two has a life of eight years. Okay? And so if we did present work analysis on these two just straight up, you know, we do the first one for four years and the second one for eight, you know, we're gonna get misleading results. But then if we, you know, take these and then we um, analyze them for the least common multiple, then we can do a much more fair comparison, okay? And so in this case, the least common multiple or LCM is eight years, right? And so the idea behind least common multiple is that the is the smallest number that you can find that's divisible by, or the that the others are divisible by that number. It's been a while since I've defined least common multiple, um, but you know I think I think everyone here kind of knows what the least common multiple is. Okay. All right. Okay. So that's so that's step one. So the step one is to first find you know what the least common multiple is among the different project lives that you do. Okay. The question is, how do you actually implement that? And so, you know, for this case, you know, product product two, you don't really have to do anything different. So, you know, you can just use eight years. This product two was designed for eight years. You just find the present worth of that one just as you normally do, okay? But for what do we do for product one, right? And so product one is only rated to go for four years. And so how do we analyze this on an eight year time horizon, okay? And so for any, pro for any um, product, whose life is less than the least common multiple, okay. what we're going to do is that we're going to assume that we can buy a replacement at the same cost once the initial or the first or whenever the product you know reaches its end of life. And so for this really quick example here, that means at the end of year four, so at the end of year four, product one will have reached its end of life. What we're going to do is we're going to buy an exact copy of, of product one at year four, and that's going to take us up until the end of the, the eight year, okay? And so it's going to have the same initial cost as the initial one. And so, uh, you know, and we, we basically just kind of repeat the process. So almost like copy and paste the uh, results, okay? And so of course, you know, this is this is a big assumption, right? Um, you know, if you've worked with, you know, kind of specialized engineering parts, you know, you may strongly doubt, you might push X to doubt that the same part will be available four years in the future when the company that produced these has moved on to their next, um, you know, the next thing. And it's also a big assumption to, to make that, you know, the replacement that you buy several years in the future is, is going to be the same cost that you did it today. And so you know, I realize that I know those are both very big assumptions, but, you know, they they kind of, um, we kind of have to make them in order to, you know, do this analysis in a very clean way. Okay. And so, you know, I just want to make you aware that these, this is a big assumption that we can. Okay. But if we can make that assumption, you know, it makes, it makes the analysis, um, you know, pretty easy. Okay. So, uh, I'm going to do an example here to kind of show you how that is. But before I jump in, are there are there any questions on on this? Okay, all right. So let's do an example to, just so you can see, you know, how this how this is going to go. Okay, and so this this example, 
I wrote this three years ago, but it's strangely relevant today. And so let's say that Southern California Edison is considering the purchase of a new pump to come to boost its hydroelectric, um, um, you know, um, power generating capabilities. Okay. And so SC, SCE there stands for Southern California Edison, but you know the, the company doesn't matter. It's just there for, for flavor text. Okay? And so um, you know the, the engineers at SCE have uh, found two possible vendors. Okay? And so vendor A, unnamed vendor A, is offering a pump with a seven thousand dollar initial cost. With an annual maintenance of fifteen hundred dollars, okay. and a salvage value of twelve hundred, um, twelve hundred dollars after twelve years. Okay, so that's vendor A. Vendor B, vendor B is offering a pump that will work at an initial cost of five thousand dollars. Okay. Uh, maintenance cost is one thousand dollars. And a salvage value of one thousand dollars as well. Okay. But uh, vendor B's pump will only last for six years. Okay. All right. So we're going to assume the interest rate here is seven percent. Okay. And what we want to do is we want to perform a present worth analysis to determine which is the better pump to buy. Okay. And so we see right away that you know the thing that stands out here, you know, because the because the cash flows are relatively the same as the previous example. But the thing that stands out is that you know these two pumps have different product, right? So the first one can last 12 years, the second one will last only six years. And so at the end of year six, you know, if we if we want to compare these with present worth analysis, we're going to assume that we're going to buy the exact same pump, and that's going to take us to the end of, of year four. Any questions on the uh, on the problem set up here? Okay, so let's go ahead and start uh, working on this. And so, just like the previous example, let's start with the cash flow diagrams. Okay. And so, let's start with vendor A. And so vendor A lasts for 12 years. And so let's see if I can draw 12, exactly 12 dots. Okay. And so vendor, uh, vendor A has an initial cost of $7,000. And the maintenance cost each year is fifteen hundred. And so, I'm not going to draw. I'm not going to write fifteen hundred twelve times. Okay. 
And so let's say all of these are 1500. And our salvage value at the end of year 12 is $1,200. So now let's draw the cash flow diagram for vendor B, right? Remembering vendor B here, their pump only lasts for six years, right? But, you know, since we're comparing this to pump A, um, you know, we need to extend the analysis period up to 12 years, right? Just to make sure that both have the same least common multiple. <coughs> Okay, so vendor B, vendor B has an initial cost of $5,000. Okay. And then for the first six years, we, we're gonna have a maintenance cost of $1,000 each year. So all of these are gonna be $1,000. Okay. And that first pump, we can salvage it. And so our salvage value here is going to be one thousand dollars, and that's going to happen on year six because you know the, the uh, pump B is only rated to last for six years. Okay, so at, after at the end of year six, we're going to assume that we sell we sell the pump. Okay, let me go ahead and switch to a different color here. Okay, and so you know we're faced with the situation here where you know we want to analyze this uh, this pump here for twelve years, but it's only rated for six. Okay, so remember in these cases what we're going to do is that once the first pump expires, you, it's not really expiring, but you can you can think of it as expiring. Um, we're just going to buy another pump, and so at year six, right when that pump expires, we're going to buy a new one. Okay, and so we basically incur the same initial cost again. Uh, when the first one expires. And so, you know, we're going to have, we're going to buy a new pump at $5,000. We're going to apply all of our maintenance costs here. Okay. And then we have another salvage value as well. And so that salvage value is going to be $1,000. All right. So there is our uh, two cash flows. Okay? And so we're gonna use present worth analysis. Here, present worth, I think is a little bit more useful because you know we have cash flow diagrams here that look you know, quite different from each other. And we're gonna determine which one is the better, the better option to go. Okay? Okay, so let's compute the present worth of A first, okay, because I think that one's a little bit more straightforward. And so present worth of A, we're going to take our initial cost, which is A minus 7,000. Okay. Then we have our maintenance costs, and so our maintenance cost is a, is a cost of $1,500 per year for 12 years. Okay. And so, of course, you know, because this is a recurring cost, which is the same every year for 12 years, this is a uniform series A. And so if we want to convert this to a P, we're going to need a P over A converted factor. Okay. Our interest rate for this problem was 7%. And the number of time periods is 12. Okay. To that, we're going to add, um, we're going to add our uh, um, salvage value. Sorry, brain part is for a second. And so that salvage value is $1,200. It's a single lump sum in the future. And so that's considered an F, okay? And so if we want to convert that to a P, then the conversion factor that we need is P over F. Okay. 
And so um, the interest rate is 7% and the um, N is 12. And so just like in the last problem, we have these conversion factors that we can look up, we can look up in the compound interest table. Okay. And so if we do that, this first conversion factor, the P over A, this is a 7.943. And the second one is a 0 0.444. Right. And so we perform the arithmetic. We have uh, 7,500 and 1,200. Okay. Um, and so um, if we go ahead and perform this arithmetic, we, what we get is minus 18,381 dollars and 70 cents. Now we have present worth of, of B. Okay. So here we have a little bit more complicated of a cash flow diagram. Okay? And there's and there's multiple ways that you can do this. Okay. And in particular, you know, I think what a lot of people see is that in places like year six and year 12, right? We have multiple cash flows happening at the same time. Okay. And so what you can do in these situations where, where you have multiple arrows, when you have multiple arrows occurring at the same period on a cash flow diagram, you can kind of lump them all together in one, okay? And so, you know, because of interest rate, you can't, interest rates, you can't add cash in different time periods, but if the caches are, are all appearing in the same time period, you can actually add them together, okay? And so another way to express this one right here, okay, so this is year six, okay? And so in year six, we had several things. And so we have a salvage value of 1,000 that's going up. We have a maintenance value of 1,000 going down. And we have another cost of $5,000, okay? So what some people like to do is that they, they take this up 10,000 and the bottom 10, uh, uh, excuse me, this up 1,000 and bottom 1,000. We say that those two are gonna cancel out, okay? And all we're left with is just a single down arrow of $5,000. So that's so that's one thing that you can that you can do, and then now you're analyzing a cash flow diagram with you know just a single five thousand dollars on year six. Okay? Same thing for year twelve. So for year twelve right here, we have an up arrow of one thousand, a down arrow of one thousand, and so some people would say those two are just going to cancel out, and we're just not going to worry about it. And so you know we uh, we eliminate that from year twelve from from the analysis. Okay. Right. So you can do that. But I would actually recommend keeping them separate because then it, it allows you to kind of fit things into nice standard forms, right? Remember what we talked about before? Standard forms are nice because then you can just keep it as just a single, um, you know, single conversion. Okay? So let me show you what I mean. And so when we're computing the present worth of this one, right? First thing we're going to add is the initial cost. And so we have initial cost of $5,000. Then we have to start thinking about our maintenance costs. Okay. And so our maintenance cost here is uh, $1,000, which is a uniform series. And so we're gonna convert that to a P. Okay, so we have a minus 1,000, P over A. Interest rate is 7%. Okay. And so if we kept this cash flow diagram in the old form or the previous form with multiple arrows on the same period, you know what, oops. And I expect that to happen. Okay. Right. And so if we kept the old maintenance cost there on year six, then what we have is a $1,000 uniform series for all 12 years. Okay. So it kind of makes it really clean. And so we can kind of lump all of that together into a single uniform series. And say that we have a uniform series of 1,000 that's occurring for all 12 years. Okay. 
right? So that's going to take care of all of the one, all the down arrows of 1,000 on the cash flow diagram. Okay. The only things that we have to add now are, you know, first of all, the salvage values, and then the uh, the second cost. Okay. All right. So let's go ahead and 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 add those in. So first, we have the salvage value. Okay. So let's add the salvage value in year six first. And so the salvage value is just a single lump sum. And so then a single lump sum is uh, $1,000. And so it's gonna be an F. And so to convert that to a P, we do P over F 7%, okay? And be careful for the years, right? And so remember this, this first salvage value that I'm considering, this one right here, this one actually happens in year six. And so, you know, that's why we need to put N is equal to six for, for that one. Next, we have to consider the uh, the purchase price again. Okay, so we're going to incur a cost of minus five thousand dollars in year six, right? And so that's going to be a minus five thousand p over f, seven percent and six as well. Okay. Okay, and then finally, we we add the salvage value at the very end. And so the salvage value at the end of year 12 is, um, you know, 1,000 uh, P over F 7% 12. Okay. And that right there is the full conversion that we, we have to do, okay? And so, you know, when, when you're kind of first getting used to these types of problems, I would recommend to, to just kind of keep all the arrows separate and then just kind of perform the conversions as, as, they, as they come in, okay? Because what that allows you to do is that it allows you to kind of keep Kind of maintain things like the, uh, the the uniform series or arithmetic ratings that you see, because when you start to combine arrows, then the conversion to actually, in my opinion, become a, become a little bit more complicated. Okay? And so by keeping them separate like this, then you're able to make kind of a clean formula here where everything is just converted just once because they're all they're all standard forms. Okay? But then again, you know, if you if you feel more comfortable combining arrows and then doing the conversions like that, you know, be my guest, you should get the exact same answer. Um, it's just that, you know, in my opinion, I think it's, I think it's a bit more work. To do that, to do so. Okay, so let's go ahead and, and uh, add these up. And so, you know, all of the relevant uh, uh, conversion um, factors, we can look up in the compound interest tables. And so we plug everything in and we get a present worth of minus 15,164 and 20 cents. Okay. All right. And so based based on these results, you can see here that you know we the better option to go with is going to be pump and pump B. Okay. In this case, it's a pretty significant difference. So it's about a 20%, 20% difference between the two. So, All right, and so you know this this may not be the the option that I think most people would consider because you know you would think oh I have to buy another pump in order to match up with A right but it's actually going to save you a lot of money if you do so. Your your engineering crew may not be happy with you because you know they have to install two pumps instead of just one you know but you're going to save them the company some some money. All right, any questions on on this example here? All right, and so that's and so that's kind of a, a good example of what you need to do when your product lives are different between your, your two options. Okay, let's take this a step further. And so you know this one this one actually worked out pretty nice, where you know the least common multiple was something reasonable, right? And so it wasn't something that's that's big, but you might run into cases where the least common multiple is going to be um, you know very well is going to be very unrealistic.
Okay. And so what do I mean by that? And so, you know, when you have kind of nice even numbers, you know, you find at least common multiple that's that's um, you know reasonable. But you might run into situations where you know you have just all prime numbers and the only least common multiple is their prime. Okay. And so we'll say what happens if. You are comparing two products. Whose lives are seven years and 13 years. So very nice prime numbers. All right, and so you know because these are prime numbers, the only uh, least common multiple between them is their product. And so if you take the product of seven and thirteen, what you get is ninety-one years. Okay. Okay. Right. So that's a really long time. And so, you know, most people don't actually live that long. And so, you know, it's, it's kind of unreasonable to think that, you know, you're going to use these engineering products for 91 years. Not only that, it's 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 a huge assumption to make that you know the the uh, the companies or the vendors that you're buying these from are going to sell the same products to you for 91 years at the same cost that you bought it you know from the, like the 1920s or something. So you know that's that's not that's not realistic. Okay, and so in these situations where you know the least common multiple approach is is not is not really viable or is not really you know realistic, what you can do instead is that you can kind of cut it early. And so what I mean by that is that when you perform your present worth analysis, you know, the, the, um, you know, the, the N or the number of years that you're going to set is um, instead determined by how many years you plan to use it. And so when you do this, and so, you know, let's say that you're considering those two machines, you know, seven and 13 years, you know, let's say that you only plan on using these machines for 20 years or something like that, okay? Um, and so that means you're going to be, um, you know, you're going to sell the products, you're going to salvage them before they reach their end of life. And so, you know, you could you could reach the end of the 20 years and you're done using the, these machines. They may still have some some years of life after that, but, you know, you're just not going to use them. OK. All right. So what does this mean for your economic calculations? This means that when you're done using those machines and so when you're if you're going to salvage a machine before it reaches its end of life, more likely than not, you can get some more money from it.
Okay. How much higher is it going to be? Unfortunately, it's, it's, it's going to depend on the product. It's going to depend on the situation. So, you know, usually this is something that, um, you know, you, you will have to kind of estimate your, yourself based on kind of market, market knowledge. But for this class, you know, I, I'm, I'm not going to make you look up, you know, 30 years of like you know, truck truck prices to, uh, you know, to have you estimate early salvage values. I would just give them to you. Okay? And so I think I think in the homework, I think maybe not this homework, but the, the next homework that's going to come after that, I do have a problem which which yeah, which is you know kind of like this. And so in these problems where you have to salvage early, you know, you kind of have to read the problem really carefully in terms of you know determining what your salvage value is going to be. Because a lot of times it's going to depend on how many years of life you have when you salvage them. Okay. And so if you salvage them, you know, and let's say that there's still, you know, four years of life left, you may be able to get, you know, a pretty good um, salvage value. But if you salvage them and there's only like two years left, you know, before they reach the end of life, you know, the salvage value you get may be a lot less than that. Okay. So just, you know, for these problems, just kind of read the problem carefully and, you know, just, um, just be careful on how you assign the salvage value based on how many years of life. Okay. And so I do have an example of this in, in the notes, um, but you know, just kind of based on the time, I want to get to one last topic today. Um, and so you know, that would be that would be kind of a good example that you can see in the notes on you know how this this is. But in terms of in terms of you know the mechanics of the problem, you know, do you still find present work in the same way? It's just the only thing is that you know you have to choose the salvage value based on how much life you have left. Okay. Uh, but I did. I did want to make you aware that there is there is an example of this. We just don't. We're just not going to have enough time to cover it. Okay. All right, any questions on, on this? Okay, all right, one last thing I wanted to go over today, uh, which is the idea of a capitalized cost, okay? And so these are situations where we consider the analysis period to be basically infinite. Okay. All right, and so for some, you know, for some engineering projects, you know, the you can't really put a number on how long you expect to support that economy. Okay? And so, for all intents and purposes, you know, we consider these projects to have infinite, infinite money. Okay? And so, of course, you know, it can't practically, it can't, you know, literally be infinite. And so all things will be degraded eventually. Um, but for performing calculations, we, we can assume that, 
you know, we, we're going to support this for an infinite amount of time. And so some projects like this are, are things like the roads, things like bridges, um, things like, you know, dams, things like, um, you know, a lot of public works projects kind of fall under these categories because, you know, we're not going to, you know, rip up the road and sell it to another vendor or something like that, right? We expect to, you know, service the roads, you know, for uh, all eternity until, at least until, you know, we come up with a better form of transportation than cars. And so, you know, these are projects that, you know, we have to kind of keep supporting, paying the maintenance costs or paying, you know, any kind of overhaul costs that are needed. But, you know, we can't put a number on its product. Money, okay? And so when we're doing our economic analyses for these kinds of problems, it, it presents a challenge because, um, you know, a big part of the examples that we've done, we've had to plug in a value for N so that we can look up things in like the compound interest tables and things like that. Okay? But when N is infinite, you know, you can't really do that. You can't use the formulas for that either. And so we kind of have to adjust our computations a bit to kind of, um, you know, account for these situations. Okay. So public works kind of falls in this category. And then we have to adjust our procedures. Okay. And so thus, you know, we, we, we come up with a new concept not really a new concept, but but a uh, kind of a twist on the concept that we looked at called capitalized cost. Okay. And so the definition for capitalized costs is the amount of money that you need to set aside now at a particular interest rate to yield a uniform cash flow indefinitely. Right. And so the idea is that you set aside a very large amount of money, um, you know, today, you invest that in the market, you invest that in stocks, and then each year you just collect the dividends or you, you collect basically just the interest on that, on that investment. Okay? But that initial cost or that initial investment that you put in is so large that the interest that you pull out is enough to sustain, you know, whatever, whatever project that you're, uh, that you're looking to sustain. Okay. Okay. And so to do this, to do this, we need to set aside enough money And so the idea is that you know you each year when you need to take out money from this account to pay for um, you know a, a certain project, 
you leave the initial investment alone and you only take out the interest group, okay? And so the formula for this is quite simple actually. And so, you know, for, to have a capitalized cost, you have P, okay? So P here would be your initial, initial investment. Okay. And this initial investment is the capitalized cost. Right. And then every year, every year you're going to earn interest on that account. Okay. And so the interest that you earn on that account is just the product of just whatever the interest rate is and the investment amount. Okay. And so each year when you know when when you need to pay, you know, when you need to um, you know maintain the roads or maintain the bridge, right? The only money that you take out to do that is this one. Okay. And so you leave you leave the first one alone, you leave the initial investment alone so that each year you can kind of you know keep producing money just kind of just passively. And so that initial investment there, you're just going to leave that alone so that, um, you know, you can just keep collecting on the interest every, every year. So I have, I have a very simple example. I have two examples for this. One is, you know, very simple just to illustrate the concept. And another is, you know, how this is actually used in, in, in practice. Okay. okay. And so let's say, Let's say that you have a thousand dollars. You know, maybe say you want it in a wrap or something like that. Okay, and you're going to deposit this in a bank account with an eight percent annual interest rate. Okay, Eight percent is absurd for a bank account unless it's like Davy Jones Bank Services LTV or something like that. But you know, let's say that you found Magic Bank that'll give you eight percent for a savings account. You know, let's just pretend, okay? All right. And so let's and so you know, if you if you do have this, uh, basically each year, you know, the bank is going to pay you you know that eight percent interest, okay? And so each year you're going to make eighty dollars on this account, just completely passive. Okay. And should make eighty dollars each year. Okay. If for each year, you know, each year when you collect that interest, if you just withdraw only that eighty dollars, then that eighty dollars there will be, you know, a uniform series of cash flow. Okay. Because right. remember, you know, remember our definition for uniform series. A uniform series is a, um, you know, is a recurring cash flow that happens at a regular basis. Okay. And so in this case, you know, you have a bank account, 
And each year that bank account is going to pay you 80 bucks. Okay? So if you withdraw the 80 bucks and you use that to go spend on you know, whatever, whatever you want, then that $80 is basically your um, a uniform series. Okay. That initial $1,000 that you put in, that is called your capitalized cost needed to produce this $8 uniform series. Okay. And so in theory, you know, if, if Davy Jones Bank, you know, exists for all eternity, you know, you will have a free $80 that you can collect for the rest of your life. You know, the only, you know, you only had to put in that $1,000 uh, initially. Okay. Okay. And so the idea, you know, one last formula and then we'll wrap it up for today. And so the idea is to produce a uniform series based on the interest rate. Okay. And so what we want to produce is some, uh, some uniform series A, okay? All right, and if we go back up to this formula right here, okay, that A is just going to be the interest rate multiplied by your initial investment, okay? Okay, so that uniform amount that you, that you earn each year is going to be I times the principal. Or this P right here, this is your initial or the capitalized cost. Okay. And so we can take this formula and we can solve for P just by simply dividing both sides by I. Okay. And so the, the P or the capitalized cost is going to be the uniform series that you need to sustain your project divided by the interest rate. And so, you know, if, if you if you're in charge of a public works project and you know you let's say that you're gonna need, say, you know, two hundred thousand dollars to help maintain the roads in Fullerton each year, right? And so that uh, that two hundred thousand dollars is gonna be your A, then based on the interest rate, you can compute how much capitalized cost that you need. Okay. And so universities actually use something like this too. And so if you ever heard the term endowment, then the idea of an endowment for a university is that it's a very large, an absurdly large sum of money that you can't touch, but each year the university, you know, pulls out the interest from that account to help pay for stuff like, I don't know, maybe like some new cloud or something like that. Okay, uh, any final questions on this before we wrap it up for today? Okay, all right, and so that's all we got time for today. And so on Tuesday when we meet up, I have one more example on capitalized costs just to see, uh, just so you can see how this is done. And then we'll go ahead and move on to the next topic, which is annual cash flow and value. All right, so thank you guys for coming today. I uh, hope you guys have a great weekend. Stay cool. And if there's a storm this weekend, then stay dry as well. So, you know, just, you know, bottom line, protect yourself from the weather because the weather is trying to kill us nowadays. Uh, and I'll see you guys next week.
Have a good weekend. Thanks, you too. Have a good weekend. All right, Zoom people, any, any final questions? Okay, all right, I'll see you guys next week.